Hello and welcome to the Vaults of Terror. My name is Ed and today we're going to be continuing our Blood Angels videos by going into a little bit of their genealogy and some of the background of their culture, although I will continue that in our final video on the Blood Angels relating to their recruitment and chapter disposition. So a little bit more about the genealogy of the Blood Angels. They actually have quite a stable gene seed compared to many chapters as they are fully capable of producing all the 19 organs needed to create a fully functioning space marine. Actually, the Blood Angels gene seed is so stable that it has been known to extend the lifespan of a Blood Angel to a greater extent than many other chapters, with a lot of Blood Angels being able to live well over 500 years, with some even reaching the venerable age of 1000. However, the Blood Angels gene seed is not completely pure, and that is because there is a element of it that causes severe mental disorders, which I will describe now. Now these mental disorders are linked, but they can be broadly categorised into two areas, that being the Black Rage and the Red Thirst. Now the Black Rage is something the Blood Angels suffer because of Sanguinius' death. Now I mentioned his death pr in the previous video, but to recap, it was when he was violently killed by his traitor brother Horus during the Siege of Terror. Now, the Black Rage causes the Blood Angel to relive the memories of this period and instill into them a psychological condition which causes them to believe they are Sanguinius himself, reliving the final moments of his life in the lead up to the battle with Horus and his inevitable death. Now, the condition known as the Black Rage is completely irrevocable, and should they be caught away from battle, the victims of the Black Rage will be locked in the Tower of the Lost on Baal until they are finally ready to die. Now the conditions of the Black Rage are quite clear. When they are overcome, a Blood Angel will descend to anger, hatred and fury, the only emotions that he will be able to feel. As well as Sanguinius' dying memories, the Blood Angel will be touched with a small portion of his power, which does boost their strength and vitality to superhuman levels beyond that of even any other space marine. Now rather than face a slow insane death, the Blood Angels, if they are on the front line, are able to form these Lost Marines into something known as the Death Company. Now I will mention the Death Company in far greater detail in my next video concerning the organisation of the Blood Angels chapter, however, they are in fact berserkers of the most rageous kind. They will go out and seek death on the battlefield in the most tense points of a battle. They will be on the front line, they will charge directly into a deadly burst of bolt of fire and still be able to come out the other end with enough strength to hack their enemy to pieces. Now the only people who can control a Blood Angel once they are in the grip of the Black Rage is the chaplain of the Space Marines chapter. Now the chaplain, unlike many of his brothers in other chapters, has the sole purpose of caring for those who are falling to the Black Rage and counselling those who may be close to succumbing to this dark mental condition. Once they have fallen into this state and have joined the Death Company, a chaplain may lead his brothers, one of the few people in the chapter who are able to guide them in this state, directing them to where they are needed most. Now, as I said, because the condition is irrevocable, it is known that almost 100% of all Death Company Marines who go into battle will die there, and it is with a heavy heart that Blood Angels must accept this, because unfortunately it is a fact of their existence. Now, I mentioned previously that there is another condition that affects the Blood Angels, and that is the Red Thirst. A lot of people are confused with it between the Black Rage and the Red Thirst, because it has been, in times past, used interchangeably, and so many people don't know what it is in comparison to the Black Rage. Now, the Red Thirst is something that is actually with a Blood Angel from the very start, when they are implanted and given the genetic heritage of their Primarch. It is in fact another facet of the rage that Sanguinius felt during his final hours. However, the condition does not contain with it any of his memories, only the burning desire to get into close combat with their enemy and rend them apart piece by piece. Now, the Red Thirst actually existed even before Sanguinius' death and is mentioned in the Horus Heresy series as being something that was actually part of their genetic heritage when they were created by the Emperor. Now, we don't know why this occurred and we don't know exactly how it came to be part of the Blood Angel's genetic makeup. All we know is that when a Blood Angel is gripped by the Red Thirst, they become a berserker of the worst kind. They will abandon firing positions, give up tactically strong locations, and go out of their mind with anger in order to get up close and grab with the enemy. They will use all their arms and armour to the greatest advantage, but will not use their guns, discarding them in favour of chainsaws, chain axes, combat knives, even their bare hands. Whatever they can do to get up close and personal with the enemy is what a Blood Angel will do when gripped by the Red Thirst. 
Also, the Red Thirst is given its name because it actually gives a Blood Angel a very strong bloodlust. Now, one of the themes of the Blood Angels, if we go out of the lore for a moment, is that they are almost like vampires in appearance. They are very long-lived, they are very perfect in complexion and artistic refinement, but when they are gripped by the Red Thirst, they become almost animalistic. They will go out of their way to seek blood, to drink blood, and become almost like demons themselves in the way that they seek it out. Back in the lore, this has caused a lot of Space Marines to distrust the Blood Angels because of their blood-drinking rituals, and many of the populace of the Imperium, although venerating their Primarch and giving them great praise in battle, will be fearful of the Blood Angels because of the rumours that surround them, mainly the fear that they will be taken in a night by dark warriors and be drained of their blood for dark rituals. It is, of course, mainly rumour and conjecture. However, it must be said that even if it is part of the Blood Angels' culture, many do feel it is a precursor to their fall to the demonic, although in the 10,000 years that they have practiced these beliefs, they have yet to go as far as to worship dark gods. Now, moving on from the genetics of the mental problems that the Blood Angels suffer, there has also been a degree of adaptation within the Blood Angels to handle these problems. Now, as I mentioned, the chaplains are mainly devoted to dealing with those who have fallen to the Black Rage, so it has fallen to the Apothecaries, who have become known as Sanguinary Priests in the Blood Angels chapters and their subsequent founding chapters, to administer the spiritual rites and spiritual features of the chapter. Now, to that extent, they also conduct many of the blood-drinking rituals that I mentioned before. Now, far from being a demonic sign, the blood-drinking rituals are a method of getting closer to their Primarch, Sanguinius, because they feel that the blood that flows in their veins directly descends from his blood, and that by drinking, they get closer to him and how he was when he was still alive during the Great Crusade. Now, to enable this blood drinking, there is a device carried by the Blood Angels Apothecaries, or Sanguinary Priests, known as the Exsanguinator. Now, this usually doubles up as a device that could be used to extract the gene seed, as normal apothecaries do on the battlefield. However, the Exsanguinator can be used at the precursor to a battle, to usually fill a relic chalice, to then pour into it their own blood and the blood of their brothers. By each drinking this blood, the Blood Angels reaffirm their bonds as brothers, and show that they are willing to sacrifice everything in order to preserve the Imperium. The Sang Now moving on to a little bit of the culture of the Blood Angels outside the battlefield. In the beginning, Sanguinius did much to establish the culture and beliefs of his chapter, beyond that of monistic warriors. There is a very mystical streak in many Blood Angels, and they have a strong belief that things can be changed for the better, even from the darkest days of the Horus Heresy. This belief can be seen in everything they do, and they do strive for perfection in virtually everything they attempt, be it combat or ranged warfare, to artistic pursuits and spiritual guidance. It is known amongst many that the Blood Angels war gear is some of the most finely crafted and ornate war gear in the legions of the Space Marines due to the amount of time they spend perfecting their art. It is also known for Space Marines to paint devotional murals and even weave tapestries in their spare time as a way of channeling their Primarchs more human and artistic sides, as it is known that Sanguinius was one of the few Primarchs who was not only bred for battle, but understood the beauty of the universe and attempted to preserve that where Ever possible. Now finally, moving on from their culture, I just want to talk a little bit about a quirk of the Blood Angels, which is their formation from a neophyte to a space marine. And what happens is that although the organs are implanted into a neophyte as normal, they will actually spend up to a year inside a blood-filled sarcophagus. Now this may seem quite grim, and again it does harken back to the vampire analogy I made earlier. However, the idea is that it will enable their bodies to grow and adapt to their organs. And it's theorised by some that because they spend this time actually adapting to their organs before being able to use them, it places less stress on the organs and does allow the Blood Angels their long age that can be seen in many of their military commanders. Now, that is the end of my video concerning the culture and genetics of the Blood Angels. Next week I'll be moving on to dealing with their organisation and makeup, also dealing with some of their specialist units and characters. Now don't forget, if you do have a chapter you would like to see in our next set of chapter videos, do vote below. Also, if you have any questions or queries, again, you can either put it in the comments below or contact me directly and I will do what I can to answer them. We are still looking for questions for our Q&A, so if you do have any sort of longer questions that you think would be better answered by myself, 
talking rather than having to read reams and reams of text that I've typed, then do ask that question and say specifically you want it in the Q&A. We also will be moving on to start doing a few more other aspects of the Warhammer 40,000 universe apart from the Imperium. As I have noticed, we are getting a few discontented murmurs here and there talking about wanting maybe the Imperial Guard or maybe dealing with Chaos or Eldar or one of the many different species and other factions out there. Now, I can't promise they're going to come anytime soon because we're going to try and get the Imperium out of the way because for a newbie, if you're trying to go straight into dealing with the Chaos and the Eldar, God knows what you're going to be doing. So, as long as I can establish this foundation of the Imperium first, hopefully, once we've dealt with that, people will have a better founding to move on to the rest of the Warhammer 40,000 lore. In the meantime, don't forget to vote below, and I hope to see you next time on the Vaults of Terror.